Hola, bienvenidos a una nueva edición del proyecto de Historia Real del Instituto de Estudios Mexicanos de CUNY. Soy José Guerra López. Es un placer compartir con ustedes otra vez más este espacio de difusión de diálogo para toda nuestra comunidad. Les saludo, como siempre, desde los estudios de BronxNet en las instalaciones de Lehman College, por supuesto, aquí en el Bronx. Hoy tenemos el gran gusto de tener con nosotros a Gabriel García Román, un talentoso fotógrafo y artista visual mexicano egresado de CUNY con licenciatura en estudios artísticos y quien se ha desempeñado en una carrera multidisciplinaria que le ha permitido exponer su arte en espacios como el International Center of Photography aquí en Nueva York, el Museo de Arte Latinoamericano en Long Beach, la Galería de la Raza en San Francisco, el Center for Photography en Woodstock, New York y muchos otros espacios que nos llevaría a una buena parte de nuestro programa para mencionar todos. Gabriel, bienvenido. ¿Cómo estás? Gracias, gracias. Bien. Pues Gabriel, me gustaría iniciar este diálogo eh, preguntándote, eh, como comenté al principio, eres mexicano, ¿de qué parte de México eres? Ay, soy de Zacatecas. Zacatecas, sí. ¿algún específico, un pueblo especial? Sí, de, ciudad? de Jerez, Jerez, Zacatecas. Jerez, Zacatecas. Uh -huh. ¿Y qué te hizo dar este paso a llegar a Nueva York? ¿Cómo llegaste a Nueva York de Zacatecas? Bueno, de Zacatecas, este, tengo más de... Nos, me vine a los Estados Unidos a los dos años con mi familia, pero me crié en Chicago. Y eh, hace como 24 años es cuando me vine aquí a Nueva York. A Nueva York. Ya tenía como 26 años entonces. ¿Y por qué Nueva York? ¿Por qué Nueva York? Uh, porque para mí Chicago nunca, se, nunca me sentí como que era mi casa o como que era, like, I belong there. Uh -huh. Y me vine aquí a Nueva York de, con vacaciones con mi pareja y me enamoré de la ciudad. Y dije, aquí es donde tengo que vivir. Y ocho meses después, ya estaba aquí. Ah, qué bien. Mm. ¿Y cómo te recibió Nueva York? Uh, muy bien, fíjate, porque en Chicago siempre me sentía un poco solo. Y, y aquí en Nueva York encontré a, a una comunidad, mi familia. Uh, y, y es cuando encontré el arte también. Y es... Sí, pasamos un poco a, a tu arte, ¿no? Veo que también haces un poco, fusionas tradiciones, ¿no? Tradición uh -huh. entre simbología, arte. ¿Nos puedes contar un poco esto, eh, las influencias y también eh, cuál fue tu primer contacto en el arte? Ah, sí, claro. Este, siempre, siempre digo que la primera, mi primer contacto con arte fue en las iglesias, ¿verdad? Porque soy católico y este, caminando en una iglesia ves tanto los murales y los stained glass y toda la, uh, la madera tan bonita, los pews. Y eso siempre me fascinaba a mí. Y, y cuando empecé a hacer arte, no sé por qué, pero siempre todas esas esos ideas y uh, visual iconography, I just mm -hmm. gravitated towards and I just... Entonces, sigo, eh, ya cuando empecemos a poner un poco del B-roll, vamos a ver también mm -hmm. ciertas eh, de tu obra, ¿no? Esta influencia, sobre todo con los íconos eh, religiosos. Sí. Eh, también, eh, ¿cuándo eh, comenzaste a crear en Nueva York? <risa> Yo diría como hace como dos o tres años después de venir aquí. Eh, me hice un buen amigo de una persona que me introdució a, a decir, I'm going to say this in English yeah, just because ahead. it's easier, but uh, I met somebody who introduced me to the art world, mm -hmm. you know, prior to moving to New York. I had never been to a gallery before, mm -hmm. and the only museums I had ever been to were for field trips in school. Mm -hmm. And coming here, uh, it was the first time that I went to Chelsea to see all the, you know, different galleries and exposed to so much that I would never was before. So that really opened my eyes to the possibilities of other ways of communicating. And for me, I have a very hard time communicating just because I'm a very quiet and an introvert. Mm -hmm. So art gave me that um, that facility to to be able to express express whatever is in my mind, basically. That's great. And, and so you mentioned that You're an immigrant, Mexican, queer. Mm -hmm. um, esos rasgos de tu identidad y de tu historia se ven tu arte. ¿Puedes contarnos un poquito más sobre esto? Sí, claro. ¿Cómo funciona todo esto? Este, ¿Verdad? Porque me crié bien uh, en una vecindaria mexicana y una familia bien tradicional. Nunca me vi, uh, nunca me sentí este, bien uh, 
I didn't feel comfortable being queer, right? So mm -hmm. I was always felt, I always felt alone and, and lonely, I guess, because mm -hmm. of that. And I, when I started making art, I started thinking about images and things, themes that I would have wanted to see when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's really what I'm focusing or what I focus on my work is creating visual imagery that folks like me uh, needed when they were younger. Mm, that's great. And, and is there a specific, a special uh, uh, person or, or figure that influences your art? Uh, yeah, I would definitely have to say that it, it was my dad. You know, my dad was like a typical DIY person who didn't like to hire anybody and was constantly working uh, around the house, fixing things. And even when he wasn't, he was a type of person that would take something apart just to put it back together to see how, uh, how it worked. And I was always his ass assistant. And I think just that same mindset is that of an artist, right? We're, we're constantly trying to rebuild things uh, that are in our heads and just to put them out there. And I, I always see the correlation between my art practice and that of my dad's uh, everyday life. That's so interesting because I, I can see in your collages, right, mm -hmm. uh, that taking apart certain items and then putting them back, back on. Is right. that something that has oh, to do with it? That's so interesting. I never even saw that, saw my collages in that idea, but it does make a lot of sense. Now that you're talking about like how your dad like fixes things or you just saw him see things, uh, the process itself, right, of right. opening something and discovering new parts and then reinterpreting, I right. think, uh, it's, it's fascinating, I think. Um, also, uh, did, uh, were you able to find spaces in New York to be creative in that sense, like to, to start exploring how to create? Uh, yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to that <clears throat> I'm not sure if they're still around, but there was a lot of like uh, adult continuing cor adult continuing courses mm. where you could just take a couple of classes, you know, and you didn't have to be part of a you didn't have to be matriculated in any school. You could just take. And so I was taking a lot of photo classes, print making classes uh, for a couple of years when I finally decided that if I was gonna go back to school, or I, at that point, I was considering going back to school. Mm -hmm. And I figured that as an adult, I should go to school for something that I enjoyed rather than something that my parents had think that I, or thought that I should become. So mm -hmm. that's when I decided that I was gonna go back to school for art. That's and that's when I went to City College. Oh, that's great. Well, Gabriel, muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros esta parte tan importante de tu historia, de tu identidad mm -hmm. y también de tu llegada aquí a la ciudad. Eh, vamos a tomar una pausa. Al regresar hablaremos sobre sus proyectos artísticos. Quédense con nosotros. Estamos de regreso en un episodio más del proyecto de estudio oral del Instituto de Estudios Mexicanos de CUNY. Para quienes se acaban de unir a nosotros en esta conversación, estamos platicando con el artista mexicano Gabriel García Román. Gabriel, Hola. pues continuamos la conversación. Eh, quería preguntarte también, eh, las imágenes eh, juegan un papel importante, fundamental en, en lo que es tu trabajo. Uh -huh. Y obviamente comentamos que estudias fotografía, autorretrato. ¿Puedes compartirnos cómo fue... Eh, tu primer contacto con la fotografía o por qué decidiste fotografía? Uh, sí, fíjate que era la, el the first instrument or the first way that I I've, was introduced to art and it, it was easier because I'm not a painter I'm not I don't know how to draw y la cámara es, es más fácil ¿verdad? porque puedes capturar una imagen y y para mí la fotografía nunca fue the final piece it was like the photograph and then I would do things to the photograph whether it was either weaving photographs together or collaging doing mosaics or different things like that so but uh, like I said it was it was mostly because it was a an easy entrance to the art, to making art for me but also 
I use the camera a lot for mm -hmm. a lot of self-investigative uh, themes. Like at the time when I first moved to New York in the, in the late 90s, I wasn't feeling like uh, there was a lot of Mexican uh, representation in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so I was feeling very, uh, I was missing a lot of these images that I had grown up with and I had got, become accustomed to. In a, in a way, because I was so accustomed to them, I, uh, what's the word, like I took them for granted. So when I started making art or started taking photographs, I turned that camera around and started photographing myself in a lot of these iconog iconic images of like the Mexican Revolution or mm. Juan Diego, uh, <clears throat> the, yeah, the Virgen de Guadalupe, images that I saw in my neighborhood or in different areas that I wasn't seeing here. So mm. I was sort of trying to bring back a little bit of home to... Through the lens. Through the lens, yeah, yeah. That's great. And, and so can you talk about the, the project Defining You? Uh, because it's that's kind of the project, right? Mixing images. Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So Defining You is a project. It's a portrait project that I started right around the same time that I started therapy, which you know, in therapy, the it's a constant conversation of your childhood experiences, and basically, they define who you are as an adult. So, with that idea, I thought about taking a portrait of somebody and taking a collage of their childhood pictures and weaving them around their portrait. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you know, there's multiple uh, conversations that happen with that weaving. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, you know, like glimpses of memory, childhood memories, like uh, that pass through you on your everyday, but also the idea of weaving, uh, a lot of the fo folks who I photographed are bicultural, right? Folks mm -hmm. that either are first generation American, and <clears throat> so that same idea of weaving two cultures together mm -hmm. where it's like the American culture with your mother culture as well. So. Yeah, so beautiful. Is this so the, the, the image that you just uh, described? I think it's great. Also, uh, because I, I, I te conocí, mm -hmm. no, eh, con tu trabajo de queer, queer icons. Yeah. Nos puedes platicar un poco más eh, de, de, de este proyecto, eh, por qué es tan importante para ti este. Sí, sí, claro. Uh, queer icons es un, una obra que ya tengo más de 10 años trabajando en ella, and it's a portrait series that highlights uh, and deifies queer folks of color. Mm -hmm. It started off as a personal project mm -hmm. right around the same time that marriage equality was was big on the news and the same thing with there was a lot of queer representation mm -hmm. happening at the same time in the media. But even with all of these advances, I still wasn't seeing queer folks of color highlighted or even mentioned in any of these stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, I felt like I wanted to create something for myself and for my community. You know, it's like that, th that idea of like, if you don't see something, then you build it yourself. So I wanted to insert our narrative into the art canon by creating uh, images where we see our community in a light that we normally don't ever see them. And that's like heavenly, mm -hmm. uh, proud, defiant, and so I really wanted to capture all of that. And I wanted to capture moments of the queer community. And like, I don't want to say like the famous people because that's really not about the famous mm -hmm. people. It's about people behind the scenes who are doing work. And how do you select them? Is there a process or? Uh, well, first it was my friends and other, and then became friends of friends. But then as the project got bigger, I started sourcing uh, through my community that I had created through social media, mm -hmm. either on my Instagram and back in the day, Tumblr. So I would just put a, a call out for, if I was going to say, let's say I was going to LA and I would just post and say, I'm going to LA, who are some of the people that I should photograph? Mm. And I would list, I would compile a list and just go for the folks that multiple people re, uh, mentioned. And those are the people that I would reach out to. And, and I see also text 
<coughs> intervened. Is right. why, is, why is it that part of the process? Or can you explain that yeah, process? Yeah, sure. So and when also I, the frames, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so the text happened a little later in the project. You know, I noticed that when I was showing these pieces, a lot of folks had a lot of questions to who these people were mm. and why they were being represented as saints. And so already as a community that's often silenced or just or erased, I felt like I was in a way doing the same thing. So I felt what's a good way to balance the person's voice and their image with mm -hmm. my project. And what I came up with is having the person write about their, their identity around their portrait. Mm -hmm. So all the text you see is actually their handwriting mm -hmm. and things that they wrote themselves about their identity or what, whatever it is that they really wanted to, to talk about. And uh, how many icons do you have already and how long has it taken to compile this collection? Yeah, well, I, the last time I counted, I believe I have like 60. Six, six zero? Like, yeah, six zero. 60 icons. And with each print that you see visually, there's like four other versions, variations of the same. So it's, I have quite a library of images. Y para cerrar este bloque, eh, ¿quieres compartir una experiencia significativa de, a lo largo de este proceso de uh -huh. Clear Icons? Uh, sí, claro. Ahorita. Que sea importante o que te haya marcado. Sí, fue una, una persona que había invitado para ser parte de este proyecto. Y cuando vino, se sintió bien uh, intimidated, ¿verdad? Y dijo, oh, yo no, no puedo hacer esto. So I was like, ¿qué es lo que puedo hacer para que te relajes y para que síganos? He's like, can we just hang out? Let's mm -hmm. go to your backyard and like have a beer and just, just get to know each other. Y durante ese tiempo me platicó de su historia de cómo llegó a Nueva York y todo lo que había sufrido ¿verdad? Para, para estar aquí. <clears throat> Era una persona que, like, he ran away from home mm. as a teen, came to the to New York City, and without much means, turned to sex work as a way to survive. And with that story, he mentioned a story of a friend of his who was also a sex worker who had been murdered by his John. And because he was a young queer person of color, there was no media, uh, there was nothing being done for this person. And so he took it, as a 16-year-old, he took it upon himself to go to disrupt any news conference, you know, chanting his friend's name. And I was really, like, touched by More that story tears. because, and then he's the one, it's, he's the reason why I pivoted to highlighting activists and community mm -hmm. organizers, artists, folks who do work for the community. You know, prior to that, it was just... Your it, friends it, yeah. and this. That's so interesting, Gabriel. Uh, we have like seconds, so I need to cut the break. Yeah. Uh, but we can continue the conversation afterwards. Quédense con nosotros. Hola, gracias por acompañarnos en esta gran conversación con el artista Gabriel García Román. Soy José Guerra López. Para quienes nos acaban de acompañar o unir a esta transmisión, les recuerdo que este programa es parte del proyecto de estudio oral del Instituto de Estudios Mexicanos de CUNY y pueden ver este y todos nuestros episodios anteriores en el canal de YouTube de BronxNet, eh, accediendo a través de nuestra página web. Gabriel, vamos a continuar la conversación que mm. nos quedamos antes de la pausa, que estabas hablando un poco de de cómo hiciste este cambio, this, that shift mm -hmm. from queer icons, from friends to this person that did activism. And yeah. also, can you talk about like the image itself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that, you know, that conversation with him really touched me and completely shifted the, the, the project, mm -hmm. you know, and it made me think also like these are the folks who do who have earned a halo, right? Because mm -hmm. I always think about the halo as like a badge of honor as, it, you know, it was the saint prior to the saint was just a person, a human, right? And it was through their act of, for the betterment of mankind that they became a saint. And with that sainthood, they got a halo. Mm -hmm. So that's, it made sense that, that I would focus on these uh, this specific uh, community of people. That's great. And, and, and your more, mo most recent work, 
uh, ceramics, right? Mm -hmm. La cerámica tiene también eh, una connotación de cultura de, o, o de tu identidad. ¿Nos puedes sí, platicar sí. un poco de, de esto? Sí, claro. Sí, siempre me siento que todo lo que hago es, es parte de mi identidad, ¿verdad? porque como dije antes, que siempre nunca había imágenes que representaban quién era yo. So, I started working in ceramics mostly as a way to create sculptures, I guess, pieces mm. that were, um, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. The, the word, no, it's fine, like yeah. I said, but, but, but look, uh, what I'm seeing, for example, the ceramics, mm -hmm. I, I remember the cap, right, there's a cap, yeah, is it, there some symbolism around the cap, like why is it a cactus, uh, <laughs> why a cap, like yeah. is there a, some, some... Right, so I'm, I'm working with two themes, I'm working with the cap and also a crown, Oh. Uh, cactus crown. So I started the crown first, and for me, I'm making a the crown is shaped out of cactus, right? Nopales, oh, okay. and so I use the nopal as a motif to talk about immig the immigrant community, specifically the Mexican community. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm from Zacatecas, where there's cactus everywhere, there's nopales everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it, that's a visual that I've always uh, have seen in, mm -hmm. at home. And so I created this crown shaped out of a cactus to also talk about, you know, that phrase, se te ve el nopal en la frente. But I wanted to elevate that idea and say, like, take ownership of that mm -hmm. and say, I'm very proud to be indigenous and proud to be Mexican. So I'm crea I created this crown with that idea. Uh, but also it's the same idea to where it's like the crown of thorns, you uh -huh. know, because it's like the cactus and all the needles. And uh, and more recently, because I, I do version, different versions of the same thing multiple times. Yeah. So I have like three versions of, of the same crown. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and also the, that same idea of like uh, how immigrant parents or parents who just come here and instill to their, on their children like, oh, we came to this country, not for us, but for mm -hmm. you. And you, because we sacrificed our lives, you need to be a doctor, you need to be a lawyer, you need to do all of these things to better our future or your future. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of heaviness with that, Definitely. that comes with that. So I titled that piece, like uh, heavy as a head that wears a crown, because oh. you're, you're really weighed down with all of these ideas of what, who you need to be and what you need to do for your family. Coming here, and, and the cap, the cactus, la, 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 la cachucha de nopales. Yeah, la cachucha de nopales, it, it sort of goes back to my dad. Oh. My dad, but not only my dad, and my dad is like a stand-in for laborers mm. in this country, right? It's like my dad w worked his, till his deathbed, basically, mm. in for this country. And, uh, I always use him as, like I said, as a stand-in for just immigrant laborers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the baseball cap, it, you know, it's like it shields from the sun, it uh, protects th what's vulnerable, you know. And mm -hmm. so I always, I think of the cap as another way of like a, a protection or covering mm -hmm. uh, from the elements. But also the, uh, just the, this symbolism of, of day laborers, and, and I think it's great. I love that piece, and all of them, yeah, actually. I and I, I think you also did a, a collaboration with Target. Was, can you talk about that, how it came to be? Oh, yeah, sure. And so where, what, when was it? That happened last year for Latino Heritage Month. Mm. <clears throat> and I was reached out by somebody that works at Target through my Instagram, mm. and somebody that follows me on Instagram works at Target oh. and they were like, as soon as I got into this position, I knew that I wanted to work with you and somehow, and I was, they reached out to me and I gave them some images and they created products out of some of my artwork. <clears throat> That's, some of it is still available. Oh really, it's still available, it's great. Online, yeah, it's great. And, and, and y que, que, or what items were they, you remember, <clears throat> was it like a shirt or? It, no, it was actually, I, it's a self, portrait of me oh. in a, on a skateboard. There, the image is on a skateboard and the other one is a notepad or a journal with my image. And the image 
the caption says, ni de aquí ni de allá, but from everywhere, mm -hmm. which really also en encompasses really who I, who I am, mm -hmm. right? Because I grew up always hearing, tu no eres de, ni de aquí ni de allá. Mm -hmm. And my mom always used that too, but not in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. she, it was always like, oh, you guys are screwed because you don't belong anywhere. You're not, you don't belong here mm -hmm. and you don't belong over there. <clears throat> and I really felt that for most of my adulthood and existence. And it's not up until recently where I realized, no, I'm actually a bridge mm -hmm. between two cultures and not, I'm not like displaced. I'm both. That, that's, that's so, I think, powerful, what you're saying. And, and I asked because of the clothes, because I thought that maybe this shirt was part of the collection. But to talk about the <laughs> intervention that you do to your own clothes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, talk? so, sure. So uh, I, just like my dad, I dabble in a little bit of everything, right? So a few years ago when I had my first solo show, I was trying to find a shirt with the Virgen de Guadalupe on mm -hmm. it. Then I knew that I wanted to wear her, <clears throat> and I wasn't finding anything. So I decided that I was going to buy fabric with her image and create my own shirt. And so I went on YouTube, learned, picked up on how to sew, how to make a shirt. Mm. And so ever since then, I've been making uh, my shirts every time I have a show for, anytime I have an opening for a show, I, I have a shirt. You I create your shirt. own shirt. That's so great. this shirt is from like a, a show that I had two years ago, I believe, that's for Pride. So that's I decided great. to wear it today. Uh, can you share real quick, because we have like 30 seconds, uh, <coughs> any future uh, projects that you have, like upcoming? Um, well, right now I have, I have What are you working on? Uh, yeah, right now, I'm, well, I'm still doing a residency where I'm creating all of the ceramic work. But I do have some pieces at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine where, mm -hmm. for Pride, and they're gonna, it's going to be extended for a couple of more months. So okay. you can see some of my queer icon prints in their frames at uh, at the cathedral. Oh, that's great. And of course, they can follow you on Instagram and social media. We're going to put them down there. Yeah. And I, I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing with us your process and your creative process. Um, también, I don't know if uh, to close the show, do you want to, in a frase, in, like in a phrase, mm -hmm. ¿Cómo te gustaría ser recordado por la comunidad mexicana? I know you had like 10 seconds. Yeah, that's a heavy one. <laughs> I would say probably uh, that it, I'm bringing queer representation into Mexican identity in, in the city. That's great. It was, it was, an, it, it was on point, I think. <laughs> Gracias nuevamente, Gabriel. Claro. Gracias a todos ustedes también por acompañarnos. Les recuerdo que si se perdieron alguna parte de nuestra conversación con Gabriel, pueden verla completa a través del canal de YouTube de BronxNet. Recuerden seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales para quienes estén entrando a nuestras, eh, quieren saber más de nuestras iniciativas del instituto, pueden visitarnos en todas nuestras redes sociales eh, para conocer más sobre el Instituto de Ciudadanos Mexicanos de CUNY. Muchas gracias. Mm -hmm.